Hey you guys, welcome back to my channel. Or if you're new here, welcome to the channel. Today we're gonna to be talking about the mysterious case of Natalia Grace. And even at this point, all the research that I have done, all the videos that I've watched, I don't even know what I believe. So let's go ahead and let's roll the intro and we will get right into this. So this story first came to light in 2019 when Michael and Kristen Barnett were arrested and charged with multiple counts of child neglect against their adoptive daughter, Natalia Grace. Several media outlets picked this story up because Natalia Grace was a little person with a specific type of dwarfism and she had been adopted by Michael and Kristen and they essentially had her age changed and then just dumped her off into an apartment and years later, they were arrested for abandoning her. So it was in the news back in 2019 when they were arrested. And now it is back in the news today because Michael was recently found not guilty on all charges. And all the charges against Kristen were dismissed. So, of course, it's coming back up today and people are talking about the story and once again wondering. In the eyes of the law, they were basically found not guilty. But in the court of public opinion, well, people, they're not so sure. So I'm gonna give you guys a full rundown of what took place starting at 2010 when the family adopted Natalia up until today. And you guys can form your own opinion. So let's go back to the summer of 2010. Life for the Barnett was great. Michael had a job that was putting hundreds of thousands of dollars in his bank account. He had a 5,000 square foot home in a really nice part of town. They lived in Westfield, Indiana. He had multiple vehicles. He even had a Lamborghini in his driveway. So that's how well the Barnett family was doing at this time in 2010. He and his wife had three boys, Jacob, Wesley, and Ethan. Their oldest son, Jacob, was uh, kind of a genius. He had an episode of 60 Minutes featured about him. He had been awarded an award by the Vatican. He was a pretty interesting fella. He had been diagnosed with autism. Kristen decided to open a daycare for children with special needs, children that were autistic. That way her son, Jacob, could be around other children with the same you know, condition as he had. That way he could basically make some friends. Not only did she open this daycare, but her and Michael would also go on to start a foundation focused around children with special needs. So things for the Barnett family seemed to be going great, and they decided they wanted to add to their family. So they already had their three boys, and they figured, you know, let's adopt a little girl. So they started doing their research, and they decided they wanted to adopt from Haiti. They started the process to adopt a little girl named Gilberta. They were going through the process, they received photos of her, and they were getting really excited about the idea of bringing Gilberta over to Indiana and making her a part of the family. Michael and Kristen were excited, and so were the boys. Unfortunately, an earthquake happened in Haiti, and it put a stop to everything. Haiti shut down all adoptions outside of the country. The family did not give up on their desire to adopt. They just thought that it would be a longer process. However, in the meantime of them waiting for things to get back situated with Haiti and them get Gilberta, they were contacted by an adoption agency in Florida. Now, this was kind of strange because they had never contacted this agency. And looking back, Michael says this should have been a red flag, but it wasn't then. They received a call and it was basically like, hey, we're an adoption agency in Florida. We have this little girl that would be perfect for your family. We know you guys because of the foundation. We know that y'all have a son that is autistic. And the little girl that we have, she has special needs as well. So we think she would be great for your family. But you have 24 hours to decide if you want her because if you don't, she's going back into foster care. Of course, the Barnett family was shocked and they did not want to turn 
the little girl down and see her place back in foster care. So they jumped on an airplane, left Indiana, headed to Florida. Once they landed in Florida, they went straight to the adoption agency. Now, a lot of what I'm telling you guys is from the recollection of Michael. He has done um, one documentary and several interviews. So a lot of this is coming from him. Later on in this video, um, I will be bringing up some of the things that Natalia said in her interview with Dr. Phil. She did do an interview with Dr. Phil. So later on in this video, I will bring up things that she said. But right now, it's mainly from the memory of Michael. So he says they get to Florida. They immediately go to the adoption agency. And he said he was kind of shocked. It was in a very sketchy part of town. It was in the middle of a strip mall. He even had Kristen like double check the address. He's like, are you sure this is where it's at? because it seemed like a sketchy part of town. So either way, they get there, they go inside, and they're brought into the office with one of the adoption representatives. And she's basically like, listen, this is the deal. We have a six-year-old girl from the Ukraine. Her name is Natalia. She is a little person. She has a specific type of dwarfism. I'm not gonna attempt to, to say it. So I will play the audio on how you say it right here so you guys can hear it for yourselves. Spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia congenita. Okay, so she is a little person. They showed the family two photos of her. They showed them her Ukrainian birth certificate showing a birthday of September 4th, 2003. And they were basically like, we need to know what are you gonna do? So they made the decision that they were going to adopt her. After that, the adoption representative got up and she went out of the room into the hallway. Michael says that he remembers someone being in the hallway. And um, after a minute, he realized that it was Natalia, that the little girl that they had just signed the adoption paperwork on, she was in the hallway and she was actually being dropped off by her previous family. He said while he could not see them, he remembers thinking like, how dare you give up on this little girl? Moments later, the door opened and six-year-old Natalia came running into the office towards Michael and Kristen saying, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy. Michael says, looking back, that should have been a red flag as well, but it wasn't. He said, we were just so happy to have her as a part of our family and happy that she was happy to be a part of our family, that it wasn't a red flag for him. But he said, looking back, it definitely should have been because she was six years old. She had just been returned by her previous family. She should have been scared and unsure of what was happening and, you know, sad that she'd been returned, but she was not. She just ran right in there, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy. Now, while they were in Florida, they decided that they were gonna take the kids to Disneyland or Disney World. Is there a difference? I don't really know. Either way, they took the family there and that night they stayed in a hotel room. Michael says his wife took Natalia to the bathroom to help her take a bath. And while they were in there, he heard his wife yelling. And she's yelling for him to come here. Michael, come look, Michael, come here. So he runs into the bathroom, unsure of what he's about to see when his wife, Kristen says, Michael, look at this points down at little Natalia's private area, and Michael recalls seeing a full bush. He says she had pubic hair, which was shocking to them because she was supposed to be six years old. Now to me, I'm like, should that be normal? You just adopted her that day, it's that night, and you're looking at her private. I mean, I'm putting myself in Natalia's position. How would I feel if, yeah, they're my parents legally, but I don't really know them and now here they are looking at my you know my private area how would i feel about that um either way he said they googled to see what would be the age of a young girl to develop pubic hair um, and google said eight i did a little bit of research myself and google does say that physical changes start in a young girl between the age of eight and 13. now one thing that i noticed when i was looking at that is it talked about their breast as well it said that a child's breast will begin to enlarge at the same age between eight and 13. So Michael, you know, his story later on is that she was older, she wasn't six because of the pubic hair, but did she have boobs or no? Did they not notice any boobs or was she flat chested the whole time? I don't know, either way, that was just something that 
I thought about as well, like, well, if she had pubic hair, shouldn't she have had breast as well? But Michael didn't mention that, so I don't know. Either way, Michael and Kristen, they decided to let it go because at the end of the day, they just felt like, you know what? She needs love and, you know, she's ours. So we're going to love her despite the fact that she has pubic hair. Once they got home with Natalia, they had a, you know, welcome home party or welcome to the family party. Michael's mom, Kathy, recalls how happy her son Michael was. She describes him as being euphoric at the party. She said the same way he was when he brought his three boys home, his three biological children home from the hospital. She said he was very euphoric, just a high you couldn't bring him down from. He was very proud of Natalia. Unfortunately, that happiness would not last long because according to Michael, Natalia's antics started pretty early on. Michael said that there were mornings he would get up to go to work and he would walk down the stairs and Natalia had placed thumbtacks right side up so he would actually step on the sharp part. He also recalls early on realizing that Natalia was lying to him and his wife. He says that one evening he came home from work and Kristen had actually found a pair of underwear hidden under Natalia's bed. She got the underwear out and realized that there was blood in the underwear. At that point, Natalia allegedly confessed that she had actually had her period, that she had had it for some time, but was hiding it from everyone for some unknown reason. Now, what's weird about this as well is while this allegedly happened, you know, Natalia's at home with her family, dad's going to work, her adoptive mom finds her hidden underwear, and then when daddy gets home, she makes Natalia confess this to Michael. Michael says, I get home and Kristen made her confess to me what was happening, that she had been having her period and she was hiding her underwear from us. Once again, that's a little on the weird side to me. I don't know, like do you show adopted dad your underwear and then admit what you were doing? Or I don't know, I just feel like that would be something that the mom should have handled and should have told Michael herself. And no need in having Natalia admit that because that would just still be weird in my opinion. I don't know. Now, two months into the adoption, Natalia required a surgery on her foot. That doctor actually knew another six-year-old with the same type of dwarfism as Natalia. So the doctor and Michael and Kristen, they decided or they thought that it would be a good idea for Natalia to meet this other little person and they could be friends. Um, as far as up until that point, they didn't know anyone else with the same type of dwarfism as Natalia. Now, I don't remember this young girl's name or her mother's name, but they did appear on one of the documentaries that I watched. We're gonna call the little girl Teresa and we're gonna call her mom Mary. I actually went back to the docuseries to find their names and I couldn't find the docuseries. So either way, for the sake of this video, we're gonna call the little girl that had the same type of dwarfism, who was also six years old at that time. We're gonna call her Teresa and we're gonna call her mom Mary. They appeared on this documentary and they recall meeting Natalia and the mom Mary says when Natalia walked into the room that they were in waiting for them to meet, she immediately noticed that Natalia looked way older than they were saying that she was. Her daughter was six and Natalia was allegedly six, but Natalia was a lot bigger. Her daughter still had baby teeth and had like a chubby face, but Natalia had adult teeth and her cheeks were really defined. She no longer had that baby face. Michael says in the documentary that was something that he noticed as well. He is looking at his child, Natalia, and looking at this other girl, Teresa, who is six, and he's thinking, wow, my daughter looks way older than her. He says not long after walking in, Natalia must have caught up on this as well because she starts, like she blows her cheeks, so her cheekbones are not as defined. She does this, basically, and <laughs> try to keep her face like that um, when they were looking. So maybe they wouldn't catch on to the fact that her face looked older than Teresa's. Um, Teresa's mom, Mary, also said in the documentary that Natalia could conversate really well, and she had a pretty impressive vocabulary for a six-year-old. She said, I recall thinking, 
wow, they've really worked with her on her speech and her vocabulary. She remembers being like impressed by the way Natalia spoke, not just to her daughter, but to her as well. She's like, yeah, she could carry a conversation with an adult for sure. Um, and I do have to say, look at the pictures of Natalia beside the six-year-old girl that is like, for sure she has six. I think we can all say, yes, Natalia definitely looks different. She definitely looks older in this photo. So early on in my little investigation, when I saw these photos, I was like, oh yeah, Nat Natalia was like a good 18 in this photo, right? Now, Teresa said that as well. Because Teresa, like I said, she appeared on this documentary. This is years later, right? So in the moment where Teresa met Natalia, she was six years old. But years later, when she was 16 years old, she appears in this documentary and they show her a picture of her and Natalia together. And she's like, yeah, she definitely looks older than me. And they ask Teresa, how old do you think she was when you guys met? And Teresa said, by the looks of it, I feel like Natalia was anywhere from 18 to 20 years old when we met. And she said, I just think that's really weird because, you know, I thought I was meeting another six-year-old when in reality, I think it's possible that she was in fact 18 to 20 years old when we met, pretending to be a six-year-old, which is really mind-blowing if that was in fact the case. Michael and his oldest son, Jacob, who also appeared in the documentary, they talked about how they would ask Natalia things about Ukraine or the orphanage that she was in. They also noted that she didn't have any um, like dollies or blankets from the orphanage. And Michael said from what he knew, a lot of times kids that spend time in an orphanage, they make friends there. So when they are adopted, they will talk about their time in the orphanage, but Natalia did not. She had no belongings from the orphanage and she talked about no friends that she made in the orphanage. Um, Jacob also said that Natalia, that Natalia did not know the Ukrainian alphabet. However, I will say she was supposedly five when she left Ukraine. So I don't think that's like too suspicious that a five-year-old doesn't know the alphabet. I mean, she was in an orphanage, foster home, you know, bounced around from here to there. So that would seem like it would be normal that she not know the alphabet. I would think that she would probably know the language, but maybe not the alphabet. Now, the issue with that, though, is that Michael and Kristen, they actually knew a lady from Ukraine through their foundation, and she spoke the language, so they thought that it would be a cool idea to introduce this lady to Natalia. Natalia was allegedly from Ukraine, left there when she was five, probably felt like that was home because here she is six. She's only been in the States for a little over a year. So they're like, hey, let's introduce this lady to Natalia. They can speak to each other in their language and it'll be like a cool little experience for Natalia, right? Wrong. So according to Michael, they meet up with this lady who is from the Ukraine. And as soon as she starts speaking to Natalia, in their native language, Natalia gets mad. She refuses to talk, but she starts pouting, throwing her hands, thrashing around, and refuses to talk. Michael and Kristen, obviously, they are embarrassed, so they like thank the friend for meeting up with them and they leave. Michael says that Natalia would not speak for four days after that. He says that when he heard the lady speak, it kind of dawned on him, like Natalia doesn't have the accent. She doesn't have a Ukrainian accent. And he believes that the reason that Natalia would not speak is for one, that she did not know the language. And for two, she, he feels like she was like, oh, wow, they'll realize I don't have the accent. So let me not speak. He says she did not speak for four days once they met this lady. So four months into the adoption, Michael talks about how Natalia would make a point to sit by the youngest son every time they would get in the car to go somewhere. He said that she would get next to the youngest and would do things like fart on him. What were you doing to bother Ethan? I was farting. Did you keep doing it while you were in the car with him? Or pee in the seat or she would poop in the car and then stick her hand in it and then rub it on the youngest son, Ethan. Michael said that 
for his son Ethan to get in the car and go somewhere was like him going to a haunted house, basically. It got to the point where every time they were going to load up, Ethan didn't want to go because he was worried that Natalia would try to pee on him or poop on him or fart on him or something like that. Now, I don't know, the pooping and sticking your hand in it and rubbing your sibling, that's a little overboard and extreme, but I would say like the farting on your sibling, that's so normal. Like my brother did that to me and he wasn't evil. He wasn't psycho. He wasn't a sociopath or nothing like that. That to me, it is a little extreme, but we do have to remember here that she was in an orphanage. She was in a different, um, she was, with, she was with different adopted parents, so her behavior might would seem a little extreme, maybe. But I would definitely say the farting on your sibling, that was probably a joke. Um, the pooping, extreme. And some kids would get mad. I know kids that at young ages would get mad and pee in the seat. So, I don't know. I, I guess some of it could be seen as normal, while some of it is a little on the extreme side. Now, Michael also talks about instances where Natalia would get her brother's favorite toys. Like one of the boys really loved cows. One of the boys really loved race cars. So she would get like his favorite cow and the other boy's favorite race car. And when they would be going somewhere, say they were walking by the highway, right as the vehicle came by, she would take the toys out of her pocket and throw it into the highway. And then the boys would see this and their reaction would be, my toy, you know, want to jump in the street to get their toy once they realized that Natalia had just thrown their favorite toy into the street. Michael says it's his belief that Natalia was actually trying to kill her siblings by doing this. Michael said there was a time he came home from work and Kristen had found a knife under Natalia's bed. So Michael asked her, like, what were you doing with this knife? Why did you have this knife under your bed? And her response to Michael was, because I'm gonna kill you in your sleep. I don't know, at this point, I will be contacting someone, right? The, the adoption agency, a therapist, or someone. Now, Kristen did contact someone. She contacted the neighbor, her and the boys, went over to the neighbor's house, and she broke down crying. And the neighbor appeared on the documentary as well. The neighbor's name is Rachel. And Rachel recalls how Kristen and the boys came to her house and Kristen broke down saying, Natalia is not who we thought she was. She's dangerous. She has knives. She threatens to hurt us. And Rachel says, even the boys was like, yep, yep, this happens. Now, what Rachel said at that moment, she decided, well, I'm done with this family. Rachel said she had a six-year-old little girl who would often play with Natalia. She would go over to the, the Barnett's family home and play with Natalia and the boys. But at that moment, she was like, you know what? This could be dangerous. So I'm not going to allow Natalia back to my house and I'm not going to allow my child over to their house. I don't know how much Rachel could have really done, but her solution to the problem was, well, I'm separating myself from that family because I don't want to be put in danger. Now, Michael did say eventually they reached out to the adoption agency, but they offered no help at all. So he started seeing therapists. He started bringing Natalia to therapists. The family would see therapists together. He said after three or four different therapists, Natalia finally received a diagnosis. He said the therapist pulled him and his wife into a conference room and basically said, you guys are in extreme danger. Natalia is a sociopath and everything that she does is calculated and a part of a greater plan. She told him that at this point, Natalia could not have free reign over the house. She needed to be watched everywhere she went and every second of the day. Michael says he and Kristen still did not want to return her. They were still thinking that there was something that they could do to help her. I don't know, I think if it was me and I really thought my family was in danger and if a professional really said like she's a sociopath and your family's in danger be careful with your other kids I don't know I think at that point I'm like okay adoption agency we're bringing her back to you I mean it really makes you question too why did the other family bring her back right either way he couldn't get any information on that because it was a closed adoption so him finding out why they did bring her back it was a slim chance that he would be able to especially through the adoption agency now, Michael goes on to recall a night that he woke up 
and Natalia was standing at the foot of their bed, his and his wife's bed. He said that he asked her, what are you doing? And she said, nothing. So he asked, well, why are you in here? And she said, I don't know. Now, not only was she standing at the foot of the bed, but she had a knife in her hand. But she says, I don't know why I'm in here. So he instructed her to put down the knife. He says that she did. And he told her, go back to your room. And he says that she did. He said at that point, he jumped up, he got the knife. They hid all the knives in the house after that. But he says he sat outside her bedroom for the rest of the night because he was scared that she would get up and try to hurt someone. A few nights later, he says he was asleep and he woke up hearing this loud noise. So he jumped up and went walking through the house to try to figure out what was going on. He was eventually led by the noise to Natalia's room. When he opens the door, he says Natalia is standing in the middle of the room, just standing there. And he's like, what are you doing? And she says, I'm waiting. And he says, for what? And she says, I'm waiting for you to go to sleep. Which is kind of weird to me because I'm like, well, he was asleep. So really, if you had a plan on doing something, you could have did it because he was asleep. Either it's a lie or she was just like messing with him because he really was asleep. So either way, Michael says they continued therapy and um, he was really convinced that she wasn't going to hurt them and that she could be helped. And he said, eventually, it did seem like it was getting better. Natalia seemed to be happy to be a part of the family. And there were days that she would get up and be like, hey, what can I do to help? One particular day, she got up and um, Kristen was washing dishes. And she was like, hey, mom, what can I do to help? So Kristen was like, hey, if you want to finish these dishes, go ahead. So Natalia pulls up a chair and she starts washing the dishes. Kristen walks out of the room, leaving her coffee cup on the counter by the sink. A few minutes later, she walks back into the room, and according to Michael, Natalia is pouring Pledge in Kristen's coffee. Now, when I was doing all my research, um, I saw a comment that somebody made saying, you can't pour Pledge. It's in a spray can. So, I looked up Pledge, and sure enough, it's in a spray can. So, I don't know if back in 2010, 2011, 2012, if there was some sort of Pledge that you could, in fact, pour. But from what I saw online, it was just in spray cans. So, um, once again, this could be a story that is not truthful, or maybe it was something else, and he just got it confused. But... Kristen immediately asked Natalia, what are you doing? And she says, I'm trying to poison you. Once again, I think at that point, I would have been taking her somewhere, you know, back to the adoption agency, flying her back to Ukraine. I don't know, somewhere. You try to kill me, like, one strike, you're out with that situation. You know what I'm saying? Either way, she stayed in the house. And the family refrained from doing anything, according to Michael. They didn't want to go out and about because they were scared that Natalia would do something. So several months passed and their son Ethan's birthday rolls around. Ethan had this like obsession with cows. He really liked cows. So they decided, you know what, we're going to go somewhere for Ethan's birthday. They find this place called Trader Point Creamery. It has cows and you also can milk a cow. So they decide they're going to take the whole family there. I think I would have, like, left her with a babysitter or something. I don't know. But they bring the whole family there. Once they get there, they find out they have to sign a waiver because at the creamery, there are um, electric fences. And it's basically, like, if you touch it, it can shock you. So they basically had to sign this paper saying that if you touched it and it shocked you, the establishment would not be liable for you getting hurt. Michael says... When the employee told them about the electric fence and then, the, you know, needing to sign the waiver, he says Natalia's eyes just lit up when she heard this and she went on to sign the waiver. According to Michael, they had to walk this trail and the electric fence was, you know, going down the path of the trail. So they all start walking, but they are only a few minutes into the walk when Natalia sits down and refuses to walk. Now, Michael says that then he and his wife decide, you know what? She's not going to ruin this for us. This is Ethan's birthday. 
So they decided that Michael and the rest of the boys, they will keep walking and Kristen will deal with Natalia. So Kristen sits down beside Natalia and is like, you know, you got to get up. You know, we need to do this. Let's keep going. Michael says he is just a few minutes into the walk when he hears sirens and ambulance and everything. And his thought was Kristen's dead. Oh my God, Natalia killed her. So he and the boys, they take off. They make it back up to where they left Kristen and Natalia. And at this point, there's cops there. There's an ambulance there. And Kristen is just beside herself. Michael says that Natalia attempted to push Kristen into the electric fence. And that Natalia even admitted this to the police and the EMTs. She's like, yep. I was going to kill her. I was trying to push her into the electric fence. I wanted to hurt her. I want to kill my brothers. He says she admitted all of this right there to the police and the EMTs. Now, a young man named Chris, he did appear on the documentary that was filmed later on. And he said that was not his recollection at all. Chris says he remembers getting a call that there was a little person down the trail that was distressed down by the electric fence. So he made it down there. And once he was there, the mother, Kristen, she was the one that was upset and that the little person was the one that was more rational. Chris was then shown a video of Michael's explanation of what took place. The whole, oh, I was running back. I thought she was dead. And Natalia was going crazy. I want to kill him. I tried to kill her. I want to kill her. I tried to push her into the fence. I'm trying to kill my little brothers. I want to kill them. The employee says that did not happen at all. He remembers no threats being made by Natalia. And if anything, Kristen was the one making the situation worse that day. Now, according to Kristen and Michael, they say that Natalia refused to walk. And when Kristen was trying to get Natalia up, then Natalia, you know, jumped up and started trying to push her into the fence. And that's what happened. Now, Natalia would later say on the Dr. Phil show that the reason she sat down is because she was tired, her feet was hurting, she hadn't ate that day, so she wasn't feeling good. And being a little person, like your bones and your joints, they will hurt, especially when you walk for a while. So she says she just sat down needing a moment, that it wasn't like, oh, I'm refusing to walk. She just needed a moment. She said Michael and the boys did proceed down the trail, and Kristen did sit down with her, basically saying, you got to get up. Come on, let's do this. So she said she tried to get up. Kristen was trying to help her, but she fell over on Kristen, kind of, and then Kristen started just going crazy saying, you tried to throw me in the fence. But according to Natalia, that did not happen. And according to Chris, one of the employees at the creamery, he has no recollection of anything like that happening either and says that it was definitely Kristen who was making the situation worse. Now, whatever happened that day, Natalia, she was taken by ambulance to a mental health facility and she was admitted into this facility. Now, once again, you know, this is Michael's side of the story, but he says that when Natalia was in this facility, that she admitted to the doctor at the facility that she did want to kill Kristen, that she did want to kill the boys, that she had visions of her stabbing the boys and dragging their dead bodies outside and then leaving them under the deck of the house. Michael said on the documentary that Natalia was under 24-hour observation with over 90 medical staff, personnel, and psychologists working with her. Just a few days after she was admitted into this facility, Natalia was taken up to the adult wing of this facility. She obviously was placed in the children's wing, um, but once medical staff discovered that she did in fact have pubic hair, they thought, you know what, maybe she's an adult, and they moved her to the adult wing. After she was moved, medical personnel, they did speak in this documentary, and they said that once she was moved, she refused to talk, acting like she did not understand English. They would later catch her speaking English to males in the facility, and she was actually speaking to them in a sexual way. 
The hospital staff even went as far as saying that they believe that Natalia may have been performing sexual favors in return for money. Like some of these patients up there, the male patients would pay Natalia and she would perform sexual favors for them. Which if you think about that, if she was really six or seven years old back then, that is disgusting. But some of the medical staff did go on record to back these claims up saying she did talk um, at a line to some of not only the guys in the facility, but like the medical staff, she would make passes at them and it become a problem essentially. Now, Michael's son, Jacob, in the documentary, he remembers when Natalia was admitted into the mental health facility. And he says at this point, he and his brothers were finally at peace that they went back home. And for a few weeks while Natalia was not there, they were not scared anymore, but that wouldn't last long because a few weeks after she was admitted, the hospital would call Michael and say, Hey, you got to come get Natalia. Like we really don't know what to do here. You know, she is allegedly a child, but she has pubic hair. We put her in the adult wing of the facility, but she's making moves on the men there. And we don't want to be liable if something happens. So you got to come get her. So Michael and Kristen, they loaded up and they went and got Natalia and they brought her back home. Now at this point, they decided, you know what, that's it. We are going to get the truth out of her. We're going to get her to tell us her age. We're going to get her to tell us where she's from, why the other family returned her. Like we're going to find it all out tonight. So once they got home, they started grilling Natalia for the truth. But Natalia, she wasn't going to break. If there was anything to even break with, you know, they were asking her, like, we know you're older. Or we know for some reason they brought you back. Like, what is the truth? She didn't give them any information. They ended up putting Natalia outside on the back porch with a pillow and a blanket and told her that if she didn't want to tell them the truth, she could sleep outside. Now, they didn't leave her out there all night, but they did leave her out there for about three hours. It was long enough for one of the neighbors to figure out what was happening. So they bring Natalia back inside, but not long after they bring her back inside, a police officer and a CPS investigator show up at their home. Like, hey, we got a call that you guys put your young special needs child outside on the back porch to sleep. So according to Michael, they explained what was happening, that she was lying to them, that she was older than she claimed, that she was trying to hurt them. And Michael says that the officer realized that Natalia was not the one in danger, but he and his family was. They took a report, but they left the house. And Michael says the officer returned a few days later with some information on Natalia. So when the officer returned to the home a few days later, he brought documents from when she entered the United States from the Ukraine. He also brought a picture of her from when she entered the States. Now in this picture, Natalia allegedly looked a lot different. She had baby teeth, but you know, now she has adult teeth and it's only been a little over a year. They show the photo to Natalia and they ask her, who is this? And she's like, I don't know. But even the officer and Michael and Kristen were like, yeah, it doesn't look like her. Some of the information on the documents did match, like her height from when she entered the States was exactly the height that she was that night down to the centimeter. She had not grown at all since she entered the States. Michael says it was at that point that Natalia admits that when she was in the orphanage, they gave her a new birthday. The detective basically says, listen, you guys, she's older than what you guys think, and y'all need to work on getting her age corrected. Michael says at this point, again, he contacted the adoption agency, hoping that they could find, you know, her real birthday or something along those lines. But because it was a closed adoption, they would not give them anything or not right then. Michael says later that evening, he received a call from one of the ladies at the adoption agency, and he says it was pretty obvious that she wasn't supposed to be calling him back to give him this information. But she said, listen, I can't tell you much, but what I can tell you is go look at Natalia's backpacks that she came with when you guys took her home. 
Michael says he and his wife raced upstairs to Natalia's room. They found her bags and they're looking all over for them. And what they find was her previous adoptive parents' name, Gary and Diane Ciccone. So who is Gary and Diane Ciccone? And can he get in touch with them? Can he get information from them? This was at least a starting point. Unfortunately, it would not go very far because they couldn't get any information from them. Gary and Diane would not tell them really anything. Now, unbeknownst to the Barnett family, Diane Ciccone and her husband, Gary, they had had her for about a year. And for some reason, they wanted to return her. The Barnett family, they were contacted by an adoption agency in Florida, but other couples were actually contacted in 2009 by an organization called Little People of America. Little People of America is an organization that holds annual events for little people. That way they can get together, make friends. Um, that's where a lot of little people, they meet their lifelong friends, they meet their spouses through this yearly event. Well, this organization, Little People of America, in 2009 reached out to a couple trying to get them to adopt Natalia. The lady's name was Judith, and she recalls getting this email from Little People of America, basically saying like, hey, we know you're interested in adopting, and we have the perfect little girl for you. She is a little person, and she's in dire need of a home. Now, Judith said when she saw the photos of Natalia, she was like, that's my daughter. This is who I'm meant to adopt. So she started getting information on where Natalia was, you know, what was happening. And she found out that Natalia was with another family, but she had only been with this family for less than a year. She said that wasn't really the, you know, the biggest red flag. And she was still planning on getting Natalia until she found out that you have to pay a $25,000 fee to adopt her. And she found out that Diane Giacconi had paid that fee. So her and her husband, Judith and her husband, was basically like, why would someone pay $25,000, this fee, to adopt a child, and then less than a year later, be ready to give her up? Like something doesn't make sense here. So they just felt like that was something that they couldn't do. They could not invest that type of money into Natalia and then have the same experience as Diane Giacconi. So she was just like, big red flags. We decided we were not going to adopt Natalia. Another family as well was contacted, Robin and Dwayne Ferris. They received an email from the Little People of America organization as well, saying the same thing. Hey, we know you guys are interested in adopting and we have the perfect little girl for you. Robin and Dwayne, they too, was very interested in adopting Natalia. So they got in touch with Diane Giacconi and they made plans to visit with her. They drove out to her house and they said one of the first things that they noticed when they got there is that Natalia was walking around outside with no shoes on and it was like gravel. And they were like, wow, you know, we know that must hurt. Why does she have shoes on? Either way, once they got there, Diane set them out on the back patio and had Natalia go inside. So they talked to Diane and Dwayne said immediately he felt like Diane was lying to him. So they asked to speak to Natalia. She came outside. They asked her a few questions. They asked her what it was like in the orphanage in Ukraine. And her answer was, it sucked. After that, Diane had Natalia go back in the house. And they said they just felt like it was very rehearsed. Um, that Diane brought her out, had her answer a few questions, and then sent her right back in the house. Like there was something that she was hiding that she wasn't telling them. So they asked Diane, you know, if we're going to adopt Natalia, we would like to have her evaluated. We would like to have a psychological evaluation done on Natalia. But Diane said, absolutely not. So the couple went home, they talked it over for a couple of days, and they decided, you know what, too many red flags, we're not gonna adopt Natalia. So Robin, she put in the phone call to Diane to let her know. Once she got down on the phone and started saying, like, listen, we decided we're not going to adopt Natalia. They said Diane started yelling and screaming at Robin. 
Dwayne even remembers like being beside Robin and hearing Diane scream over the phone at Robin for saying, we're not going to take Natalia. So they were both like, you know what? Dodged a bullet. Something doesn't make sense here. Praise God we made the decision that we did. This was in 2009. Somehow it switched from the Little People Organization to this adoption agency in Florida. Because at first it was this organization trying to find a new set of parents from Natalia. And then all of a sudden this adoption agency in Florida is basically doing cold calls. <laughs> Essentially, you know, like yes, they have this list of people that want to adopt. But they're just shooting their shot, like calling everyone on the list. And that's when they, you know, call Michael and Kristen and get in touch with them. Um, now, Michael had no idea about this. Michael and Kristen Barnett had no idea about all the other families that had considered taking Natalia and why they decided not to. Either way, back to Michael and Kristen. They were told by this detective that they needed to look into getting her age changed. So they filed a petition with Maryland Supreme Court to have her birthday changed from 2003 to 1989, making her 22 years old. This is wild. At this point, we're in like 2011. So she was like seven, okay? So they do that. They have her birth year changed. She's 22 years old. And a few months later, they put her up in an apartment. And according to Michael, it was a very nice apartment in a very nice neighborhood. He paid her rent up for a year. They got her on, you know, a lot of government assistant programs like food stamps and Medicaid and things like that. But yeah, they put her in this apartment. At first, they would go visit her from time to time and go pick her up and take her to go buy groceries. But eventually, that stopped altogether because their son got a scholarship in a college in Canada. So they decided, well, we're going to move to Canada. And Natalia, we're going to leave you behind. And that's exactly what they did. They left Natalia in her apartment behind in Indiana and they moved to Canada. Before they moved, Kristen had her set up with this school, but it was a school to get your GED. It was not an elementary school that she should have been going to. It was a school to get her GED. And Natalia went. Every day she would get up, get herself up, get herself ready and walk to school, which is kind of wild because my 15 year old, I still have to wake him up. So some of these things, it's like, wait, what? As a seven and eight year old, you were so disciplined that you did in fact get yourself up, get yourself dressed and go to school and do your homework. And you were going to school for an adult. So what were you doing? Like calculus or something? Like it is confusing, right? Either way, she did it. She would have her landlord or neighbors, you know, she would catch rides with them to go to the store to get chips and drinks and things like that. But according to Natalia and probably makes sense, she could not reach a lot of the cabinets and things like that in her home. She could barely work a microwave, but somehow she was making it. Now, I do want to say that the detective, Detective Clawson, I think his name is Clawson, um, he passed away in 2015. So in this documentary, they could not bring him on to ask him if he did in fact suggest having her age changed. They did bring on a lieutenant from the department who had previously worked with that detective. And he said, you know, obviously we don't know what exactly happened here because Detective Clawson has passed away. Um, so I can't confirm that he did in fact suggest that they change her age, but they did recover an email from Detective Clawson to Heather Wilson, who was a CPS investigator. And this email included a photo of Natalia when she entered the US. Um, in this picture, she had baby teeth. Um, but it noted in the email that upon his investigation, he believed that Natalia was in fact a child. So maybe it's possible that he thought she was a child, but maybe he thought she was older because in the photo, that girl had baby teeth. A year later, she had adult teeth. So maybe he thought, well, maybe she's not six or seven. Maybe she's 11 or 12. You know, maybe he did think she was older, but not that much older. 
Now where things really started to take a twist here, I mean, more than the twist we've already taken, right? Natalia, she was hanging out outside of her apartment at like a little park and she started talking to the people, telling them like, yeah, I'm 22, I have my own apartment. And one of the girls there was like, you are not 22. And Natalia was like, yeah, I am. So the woman went and got a friend of hers named Cynthia and told Cynthia, you gotta come see this. There is this woman or girl who looks to be a child, but she's saying she's 22 and she has an apartment. So Cynthia with the woman walks back and they are talking to Natalia. And Cynthia's like, how old are you? And Natalia says, oh, I'm 22. Cynthia says, where do you live? Oh, I live over here, I have my own apartment. And Cynthia's like, there's no way you're 22. And Natalia's like, like, no, yeah, I am. So she says, can you show me where you live? Natalia brings them to her apartment and Cynthia says, sure enough, she has an apartment, she has groceries. But she's like, I just did not believe that she was 22 years old. She said to me, she looked like a child and I have other children. So Cynthia basically said, listen, Natalia, I don't think you're 22, you look like a child to me and I have other children. If you wanna come hang out at my house and you know play with my kids, you are more than welcome to come. Natalia went with Cynthia that day and apparently stayed. It was after that that Natalia would finally confide in Cynthia about what happened. She would tell Cynthia that she was in fact a child. At this point, she was eight years old and her adoptive parents abandoned her, that they had her age changed and they told her to tell people that she was 22 and that they took off to Canada to, you know, go be with their son who was a genius and he had gotten a scholarship to Canada. So that's where they were. And that she was there alone. So at this point, Michael and Kristen, they were reported to the authorities for abandoning their adopted daughter, Natalia. They were arrested in 2019 and they were charged with multiple counts of neglect. While they were awaiting their trial, they got a divorce. This case gained national attention, which caused Michael essentially to lose his job. He ended up losing his house, his cars, his family, everything. He even says at one point, in 2019 or 2020, he had like 47 cents in his bank account and he was homeless. So they were arrested in 2019. By February 2022, four out of the eight child neglect charges against Michael had been dropped. His trial started in October of that same year and he was actually found not guilty during his trial. Kristen's trial was due to begin in March 2023, just three weeks before it was set to begin. All the charges against her were dropped as well. Now, by the time the charges were dropped, Michael had a home and his son Jacob was living in his basement. According to Jacob, he regressed. Like everything that happened caused him to regress quite a bit. Um, Natalia, she did appear on Dr. Phil with her mom, Cynthia, and her dad, Antoine, or Anton Manns. That's her new, um, not legally adopted parents because she is legally an adult, so they cannot legally adopt her. But in their eyes, they are her family. They are her, you know, new parents, essentially. Natalia, she did speak on a lot of the accusations. She said she never threatened anybody in the family. She never hid any knives. She denied the incident with Pledge trying to poison Kristen. Dr. Phil asked Natalia that if Nanny Cam footage came out of her hiding knives or pouring the Pledge in the coffee, you know, what would she say to that? And she said it was impossible because she didn't do it. It didn't happen. Natalia did also talk about the previous family, Diane Shaconi, and why they returned her essentially. And she said that she was actually really close with um, her siblings in that family, that there were other children in the family. And that one day she was roughhousing with one of the children, they were wrestling and she accidentally broke one of their arms. And that was like it, that Diane was like, no more, gotta get rid of you. Um, but she basically says that there was nothing more than that. Um, other than she broke the kid's arm and uh, Diane didn't want anything to do with her after that. But the new family, Cynthia and Anton Manns, they 
say that Natalia has been fine. You know, she has normal things that she does, arguing and getting into it with her other siblings. But as far as anything outrageous, they say, no, it doesn't happen. They also say that still to this day, she does not have a cycle. So the fact that that was a part of Michael's story was that she had a cycle and she hit it. They say that's not possible because she still doesn't have one. Um, Natalia details a time where Kristen actually made her put a tampon in and then had her take it out. And she said there was blood on it. So Kristen was like, see, there's blood on that. That's a period. Which if that happened, that is disgusting. And I don't know in my mind, that's like child abuse, right? Like to have a child who was six, seven or eight years old insert a tampon just to prove to them that they're on their period. Like, I don't know. I don't know, you guys. This new family, they did have tests ran on Natalia. And um, the tests were done two years before this interview was done on Dr. Phil. When she went on Dr. Phil, she was 16. So two years before that, she was 14, right? So the test that they had ran on her actually came back that she was in fact 14 years old. Now in 2010, the Barnett had some tests ran at the children's hospital. And it said that she was eight years old, not six. In 2012, when they were trying to have her age changed, they had a bone density test done on her and it showed that she was 11, which really she should have been nine or eight, eight or nine. The same year in 2012, the Barnett family doctor said she was 14, not eight. I do have to say though, that none of these tests came back that she was 22. So that was still a pretty big reach, in my opinion, that they could have her birth year change to make her 22. Like even if these tests came back and they used them as some sort of proof that she was older, the the oldest that she would have been was 11, so, um, or 14, yeah, 14. In 2012, the family doctor said she was 14. So still, that's kind of crazy that they could have her age changed to 22. Now, a detective was able to track down Natalia's biological mom, and they did verify that it was her biological mom through a DNA test. Now, the biological mom, Anna Gava, she said that she had Natalia on September 4th, 2003 at 625 in the morning, which is the birthday on her Ukrainian birth certificate, which would mean that when the Barnett family left her in the apartment in 2012, she was in fact eight years old. That is just unimaginable. And that is also too, if her biological mom is telling the truth. You also have to ask yourself that question. Now, Michael Steele maintains that everything he said about their experience with Natalia is in fact true. His son, Jacob, also backed up his claims as well as some of the doctors in the mental facility that Natalia was admitted in back in 2010 or 2011. They also back up some of these claims. Teresa and Mary also agreed that when they met Natalia in 2010, when she was allegedly six years old, they say there's no way that she was six years old. Teresa, who also had the same type of dwarfism, says that her, in her opinion, that Natalia was anywhere from 18 to 20 years old. So it basically all comes down to who you believe, I guess. I don't know. I'm still confused, so you guys leave me your thoughts in the comment section below. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. This is a long one, I do apologize, but this case there is so much to it and i still didn't even include everything i just included what i thought was you know the most important that can make the case make sense and give you guys as many details as possible that you would need to kind of come up with your own conclusion i will link a few videos in the description box below for you guys to go check it out if you want to kind of go down the rabbit hole as well please make sure you consider subscribing to the channel give this video a thumbs up and I'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye, everyone.